Welcome back to the anatomy uh, lectures. Uh, uh, now we're going to be uh, finishing the anatomy of the hind limb after we talked about the divisions of the hind limb and the joints and the different uh, uh, components of the passive stay apparatus. We also talked about uh, the sacroiliac joint, the hip joint, and the uh, stifle joint. And uh, last time we talked about the, uh, or we started talking about the, um, the, the hock joint, uh, which which basically we stated that it consists of four uh, of four uh, articulations or four joints: the tibiotarsal or the um, uh, tarsocrural, and the proximal intertarsal, the distal intertarsal, and the uh, tarsal metatarsal. Um, uh, joint. Uh, we mentioned that uh, the um, tibiotarsal and proximal intertarsal communicate, and we also mentioned that the distal intertarsal and the tarsal metatarsal uh, also communicate. And we uh, started talking about the uh, injection of these uh, joints. So this slide um, shows where the communication uh, uh, takes place. First, between the uh, tibiotarsal or the tarsocural joint and the proximal intertarsal joint. Second, is between the distal intertarsal joint and the tarsal metatarsal uh, joint. So one injection will get these two joints, and one injection will get these two joints. Uh, now, uh, the injection to get the tibiotarsal and the proximal intertarsal occurs at the dorsomedial pouch of the tarsocrural joint. These are different views of how the injection can be done in the tibiotarsal joint. Now, the most important one is the dorsomedial pouch. The dorsomedial pouch. It's a pretty large area, and when you do the injection in the dorsomedial pouch, you need to avoid the medial saphenous vein. The medial saphenous vein. This is a this is a pretty large vein that you don't need to uh, um, you know injure with your needle because it can cause hematoma and uh, uh, you don't want that to happen. So so the medial dorsal medial pouch of the tarsocural joint is where you need to inject for the um, for the um, uh, tarsocural joint and the proximal intertarsal joint taking into consideration the medial saphenous vein. Very important. This slide shows the difference between a bone spavin, bone, and a bug spavin. I mentioned earlier that the bone spavin is an unorganized growth because it's a bony growth. It's hard to touch. And when you look at it, it's pretty irregular. However, when you look at a bug spavum, you will see that it's pretty organized, pretty regular. It's like a balloon uh, type type a, uh, 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 swelling. And if you push on one side, you will see it coming from the other side and so on. Because it's fluid filled. Um, it's a fluid filled um, uh, joint. Now, now, in order, in order for you to to diagnose uh, um, the 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 case, any any problems with the uh, 
with the, with the hawk. Uh, we have a flexion test, which is part of the lameness evaluation, and we call that the Spavin test. The Spavin test. This is how the Spavin test is done. It's basically flexion of the hawk. Flexion of the hawk. So you cause a uh, uh, pressure on the hawk for about a couple minutes and then let the horse uh, run. If the lameness increased, that means the problem is in the hawk. Also, I want you to realize here that when you flex the hawk, the stifle is also going to be flexed. Why is that? It's that it is because there is the reciprocal apparatus. The reciprocal apparatus which keeps a synchronized motion between the stifle and the hock. If the stifle is flexed, the hock is flexed, and if the stifle is extended, the hock is extended. And this is done by two structures. First, the peroneus tortius dorsally, dorsal to the tibia, and the tendon of the superficial digital flexor, which is on the ventral aspects or in the caudal aspect of the leg or the, the tibia. So this is the Spavin test. Again, Spavin test is basically part of the lameness evaluation for hawk problems. Whether it's bone spavin, whether it's bug spavin, whatever it is in the hawk, we need to perform this test. Spavin test, flexion of the hawk. This is another picture showing how we flex the hawk. Again, another Spavin um, uh, test. And if we if we if we see that there is the or or the problem is in the hawk joint, then you know after that maybe maybe radiographs will be will be an option. Maybe. Maybe joint inject joint anesthesia will be will be another another point, and so on and so forth. This is this is basically a, um, a, a radiograph of of the hock joint, and we can see here uh, uh, some osteoarthritis in the in the in the hock joint. Uh, we can we can see that there are some some even um, uh, uh, a chip fracture of some sort. Um, floating around in the in the um, in the joint space here, so that is that is a bony change or osteoarthritis of the of the um, of the uh, hock joint. Uh, this is osteomyelitis also in the hock joint. Uh, we can see in the distal tibia, and uh, we can we can also see it in the in the series of the radiographs here. Or the series of the scans compared to the radiographs, basically. So, so basically, so another another case is is also other than osteomyelitis is, is chip fractures, just like the 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 carpus in the front limb. This is a chip fracture you can see uh, here. It's pretty clear, floating around in the in the joint space. Again, most of the most of the chip fractures occur in the in the central. They call it seat of spavin, seat uh, of spavin, or also on the third uh, uh, tarsal bone. Um, you can see you can see these um, you know you can see these chip fractures because of the of the level of stress on these um, on on these uh, bones basically. Um, to to take this um, OCD out or the chip fracture out, arthroscopy is is the method of choice. This is the triangular uh, approach that I I uh, told you about before. The surgeon is one head uh, head of the triangle, and the other two hands are the other two arms of the triangle. We call that the triangular approach in in arthroscopy. And um, the 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 main thing is is basically um, to um, to uh, uh, avoid the medial saphenous vein on the medial on the medial aspect, and then uh, you you uh, enter the uh, uh, tarsocural joint or the tibiotarsal uh, joint because it's 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 very 
um, it's very spacious. And when we do that, um, again, from the needle and the, uh, especially the medial aspect, we need to, to, uh, pay close attention to the, uh, to the, uh, um, uh, tendon and the, and the, uh, tibialis cranialis muscles. So, uh, this is, this is the lateral digital extensor, uh, uh, tendon. Uh, ventral to that is the peroneus tortius, as I mentioned, and ventral to that also is the tibialis cranialis muscle. The tibialis cran cranialis muscle, the medial uh, tendon of it is the cuneian tendon. So uh, we, we, these are the landmarks basically to, to enter to the tarsocural joint or the tibiotarsal uh, joint, which is the spacious joint right here between the distal end of the tibia and the first row of tarsal bones, talus, and calcaneus. So a um, um, lateral to the uh, tibialis cranialis tendon, we can put one of the uh, one of the instruments or the camera, and lateral to the lateral digital extensor tendon, we can put the the uh, the forceps to to take the chip fracture. Depending on where the chip fracture is, that's where the you know the camera has to be on the opposite side because you have to see the lesion so you can take it out. So the the camera is always on the opposite side of the lesion. Remember that. So so with that we we conclude the discussion on the on the on the hind limb. Now now uh, let's let's review the passive state apparatus. So so the question becomes is how is the hind limb kept standing just like how is the hind, the forelimb is kept standing by the passive stay apparatus by the passive stay apparatus uh okay so so what is the passive stay apparatus of the hind limb and how what are the structures that make this this um, this uh, uh apparatus the passive stay apparatus of the uh hind limb consists of three different mechanisms three different mechanisms the first one is the patellary locking mechanism the structures that are associated with this mechanism are the patella the patellary fibrocartilage, the medial and the lateral patellary ligaments. The function of this mechanism is to keep the patella moving freely between the medial trochlea of the femur and the dorsal aspect of the tibia, guarded by these structures. So it will not be locked. So the patella will not be locked because if the patella is locked, that means the stifle joint is locked. This is what we call an upward fixation of the patella. This is a clinical case that needs to be treated by medial patellary ligament desmotomy. The second component of the passive stay apparatus of the hind limb is the reciprocal apparatus. The reciprocal apparatus consists of two structures dorsally the peroneus tortius caudally is the tendon of the superficial digital flexor these two structures make a synchronized motion between the stifle joint and the hot joint synchronized motion meaning that 
If the hawk is flexed, the stifle should and must be, fle be flexed. If the stifle is extended, then the hawk will be extended. This is what synchronized motion means. And it is done by these two structures. Dorsally, the peroneus tortius, and caudally is the tendon of the superficial digital flexor. Now, the third and the last component of the passive state apparatus of the hind limb is the suspensory apparatus. The suspensory apparatus is identical to the suspensory apparatus in the forelimb. It consists of the suspensory ligament, the sesamoid, proximal sesamoid bones, and ligaments. Suspensory ligament and proximal sesamoid bones and ligaments. These are the structures that's for, that forms or that form the suspensory apparatus. And it prevents the fetlock from overextension. It prevents the fetlock from overextension, just like the forelimb, identical to the forelimb. So if you want to compare between the forelimb and the hind limb, the passive state apparatus in the forelimb has four components. The passive state apparatus in the hind limb has three components. Patellary locking mechanism, reciprocal apparatus, and suspensory apparatus. The diseases of the fetlock, metatarsus, pastern joint, and coffin joint in the hind limb are identical to those in the fore limb. So laminitis, navicular disease, etc. Everything is identical to the fore limb. That's why we only discussed sacroiliac joint and we talked about hunter's bump. We talked about the hip joint and how there are three structures that prevent hip subluxation in equine compared to other animals and these are the accessory ligament coming from the prepubic tendon the transverse ligament of the acetabulum and the ligament of the head of the femur we talked then about the stifle joint we said it's two joints femorotibial and femoropatillary and we talked about the patellar relocking mechanism, the first component of the passive state apparatus of the hind limb, that it consists of the patella, patellary fibrocartilage, medial and lateral patellary ligaments. We talked about the communication between the two joints in the stifle, the femorotibial and the femoropatillary. We said the femorotibial has two compartments, medial and lateral. And the medial compartment of the femorotibial communicates 75 to 85 percent with the femoropatillary joint. However, only 20, 25 percent of the cases, the lateral compartment of the femorotibial joint communicate with the femoropatillary joint. That's why this needs to be injected separately. We then talked about some of the muscles on the leg and we talked about the peroneus tortius and the cranialis tibialis but before that we've talked about the long digital extensor which reaches p3 on the extensor process the only tendon that reaches 
P3 on the dorsal aspect of the hind limb. And we talked also about the lateral digital extensor, where the tendon joins the tendon of the di long digital extensor in the mid metatarsal area. We said that we need to cut this tendon at the musculotendinous junction and before it reaches, it joins the, the, the long digital extensor in order to treat a case that's called string halt. String halt is basically involuntary flexion of the hock. We then talked about the tendon of the, the medial tendon of insertion for the tibialis cranialis. And we said that this tendon underneath it, it has, a, there is a bursa. We call that a cunean bursa. And sometimes it gets infected. That's where the cunean bursitis came from. And then sometimes we need to cut this tendon in order to treat a case that's called bone spavin. Bone spavin. Now, we distinguish between bone spavin and bug spavin by the fact that bone spavin, it, we can see that the growth of the bone is irregular, whereas the lesion or the, the, the uh, bug spavin case, the, the tibiotarsal joint is basically like a balloon because it's filled with fluids. Uh, then we talked about the second component of the passivity apparatus, which is the reciprocal apparatus, which consists of two structures, dorsally the peroneus tortius, and caudally is the tendon of the uh, superficial digital flexor. Then we've talked about how the hot joints communicate. The upper two communicate and the lower two communicate, meaning that the tibiotarsal or the tarsocural joint communicates with the a proximal intertarsal joint and to inject those we inject in the dorsomedial pouch of the tarsocural joint on the medial aspect of the hub, avoiding the medial saphenous vein because it's too large and you don't want to cause hematoma there. The other two joints are the distal intertarsal and the tarsometatarsal joints also communicate and in order for you to inject them, you do the injection above the head of the splint bones, two or four. One injection. You don't do two injections, either above the head of the second metatarsal bone or above the head of the fourth metatarsal bone, the splint bones, splint bones. We then moved and said that the metatarsal area is identical to the metacarpal area in the front limb. And then we talked about the suspensory apparatus, which, can, which is the third component of the passive state apparatus of the hind limb, identical to the forelimb, which consists of the suspensory ligament and the proximal sesamoid bones and ligaments. And the function of this suspensory apparatus is to prevent overextension of the fetlock joint. With this, we conclude the discussion on the hind limb, and we conclude the discussion also on the equine anatomy lectures. I hope this was a good experience for you. Again, the videos go hand in hand with the actual lecture. Number two, there is the email address at the very first slide of each of the lectures that I gave. If you have any questions, please let me know and I'll be more than happy to explain it. Good luck and thank you.